Good afternoon, everybody. It's nice to see you all this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Carney is not in the office today, as you probably guessed. He has traveled to New Hampshire to drop off his son for his first uh, stay at an overnight camp. So he's tending to um, he's tending to some important familial responsibilities that actually seem a lot more fun than we're going to have today, but. It should be good. So. So in lieu of uh, Mr. Carney's attendance today, as they might say at the uh, London Olympics, I'll be the ones catching your javelins today. So, uh, Mr. Coonan, I'll let you toss the first one. Thank you. Welcome to the podium. Thank you. Uh, uh, two topics. Uh, first one in, in Israel, uh, Governor Romney. Uh, said that culture is a factor that accounts for economic disparity between Israel and Palestinian territories, and Palestinian officials have characterized the remark as, as racist. So I was wondering, um, does the president or the White House have a view on Romney's remarks? And two, what um, what does the president believe accounts for that disparity? Well, Jim, I saw the report to those remarks. I haven't, I didn't see the the full context of them. You know, one of the th challenges of being an actor on the international stage, particularly when you're traveling to such a sensitive part of the world, is that your comments are very closely scrutinized uh, for meaning, for nuance, for motivation. And it is clear that there are uh, some people who've taken a look at those comments and are, are scratching their heads a little bit. Uh, but I would leave it to, to Governor Romney to further explain uh, what he meant and what he intended when he said that. As for what's the president's view for that, for what the economic disparity is? Well, you know, it's, it's the president's view that certainly economic issues are among the um, wide range of issues that need to be determined, need to be settled, need to be negotiated and settled uh, in the context of, of uh, negotiations between the parties in the region. Um, but in terms of the specifics, uh, I, I don't have anything more for you on that. Also, last week Jay was talking about what the administration's position is vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem and Jerusalem as a capital. Uh, Governor Romney declared flatly that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. And I'm wondering what, what does the White House mean? Does that undermine the administration's position? Is that, is that a, a comment that, uh, that the administration would have preferred gone unsaid? What, how does the administration view that? Well, uh, our view is that that's a different position than, the, than this administration holds. It's, uh, it's the view of this administration that, uh, that the capital is something that should be determined in final status negotiations between the parties. Uh, I'd remind you that that's the position that's been held by uh, previous administrations, both Democrat, Democratic and Republican. Um, so uh, you know, if Mr. Romney uh, disagrees with that position, he's also disagreeing with the position that was taken by presidents like Bill Clinton and Ronald Reagan. Uh, so again, if, if he doesn't disagree with that position, then I would leave it to him to explain it. Last week we, we heard about an Olympic security briefing and we had the president sign a security, Israel security bill. Any chance of anything on Poland this week? Uh, not that I have for you right now. So, thank you for the question. Matt? Yeah, I'd like to ask you about not something that Governor Romney said, but what Prime Minister Netanyahu said during uh, Romney's visit. And you know, Netanyahu said, and I quote, we have to be honest that sanctions have not set back the Tehran program one iota and that a strong military threat coupled with sanctions are needed to have a chance to change the situation. Um, that seems to suggest, that suggests quite strongly the impatience, frustration with the uh, approach that has been pursued by the administration so far. Um, what's your view on that? Well, I'd start by reminding you of the situation that the president encountered when he took office. Uh, when President Obama took office in 2009, the, the international community was splintered about how to confront the challenge of Iran and their aspirations for a nuclear weapon, while inside Iran there is unanimity among that regime that pursuing a nuclear weapon was the wisest course of action. Uh, here we stand three years later because of the President's leadership on the international stage. He's marshaled interna international support, and the international community is now presenting a united front to the Iranians about the importance of living up to their international obligations when it comes to their nuclear program. Uh, this includes passing a, uh, a resolution through the United Nations Security Council with the support of Russia and China. So not an insignificant development. As a result of, those, uh, of that Security Council resolution and other actions, 
uh, crippling sanctions have been put in place against the Iranian regime um, that have resulted in the Iranian regime acknowledging the economic toll that those sanctions have taken, taken and have started, and the Iranian regime is starting to exhibit some signs of dissent uh, within the ranks. So uh, that change over the course of three years, I think, is notable, and thanks in no small part to the president's leadership on this issue. Uh, Governor Romney, in one of the interviews that he conducted yesterday, actually acknowledged something similar about the impact that the economic sanctions were having uh, on Iran. Um, and it is, uh, it is the president's view that, uh, that those sanctions are, are taking a, a, an important toll, uh, and they are steadily increasing. And uh, this administration is going to continue to work both with our international partners as well as unilaterally to continue to uh, pressure the Iranian regime to live up to their obligations when it comes to their nuclear weapons program. Uh, what if any concern is there in the administration that those words of frustration coming from Netanyahu could be translated into unilateral action, uh, unilateral military action against Tehran? Well, as you know, Matt, the, the policy of this administration has been uh, that there is a, still a window, uh, a, a shrinking window, but still a window, nonetheless, for a diplomatic solution to be reached uh, to resolve uh, these concerns uh, about the Iranians' failure to live up to their international obligations. Uh, so we're going to continue to work in, um, in coordinated fashion with the international community, including with the Israelis. Uh, we have worked, uh, you know, we've marched in lockstep with them. We've been side by side with them as they've confronted this threat and, uh, this threat, uh, and will continue to be. Uh, all options do remain on the table. That's something that we've said uh, all along that continues to be the case. Uh, but right now, what we're focused on is taking advantage of this diplomatic window that remains open to pursue a solution that, satisfied the, that satisfies the world community uh, and results in the international in the Iranian regime living up to their international obligations. So, Ian. Thanks, uh, Josh. In your first answer, are you suggesting that Governor Romney is failing that challenge of being an actor on the world stage? Well, that's not an assessment that I would draw from this podium. I will leave it to you and others who are experienced observers of candidates and presidents and other world leaders who have gone onto the world stage. Um, and have faced uh, that challenge, and uh, it's not. It wouldn't be appropriate for my position to well, to grade know? him from here. I'm not an, uh, an Olympic <laughs> judge. <laughs> as it were. Uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi is quoted as saying that Republican Jews are being exploited because they are more interested in the tax cuts that they would get from the Republican Party than the interests of Israel. Does the president believe uh, uh, Speaker, former Speaker Pelosi, is onto something with that? Well, I, I haven't seen I haven't seen those comments. Um, there are th there's no question that the there is a difference of opinion when it comes to uh, what congressional Republicans are advocating on tax policy and what the president's advocated. The president's advocated that we should seize on the common ground that exists to uh, act immediately to provide certainty to 98 percent of Americans, all Americans making less than two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, ninety seven percent of American small businesses to prevent their taxes from going up at the end of the year. So there's no question that there's a difference of opinion. Uh, between Democrats and Republicans on that on that issue, it's something that the president hopes will get resolved. I understand that the you know that this is something that uh, House Republicans are going to consider this week. Um, but you know, but in terms of of, uh, of uh, Leader Pelosi's comments, I, I I haven't seen them, so it's difficult for me to react to them. Well, there's a pretty long to-do list that we've talked about quite a bit. Uh, there are a number of things in the American Jobs Act that Congress could do, from putting teachers and firefighters and police. Well, I. I, I don't set the congressional schedule. If I would, I'd probably have a pretty long list for them uh, because there are a lot of things that the president believes that they should do. Uh, some of the important work that needs to be done to support the private sector as we, uh, as we recover from the worst economic uh, calamity since the Great Depression, um, that there's a lot that, that, that remains to be done. A lot of ideas that the president has put forward that have traditionally earned bipartisan support that Republicans haven't acted on. And, and I'll leave it to them to make up their own to-do list. I think what will be challenging for them, as they consider what to put on that to-do list, I would urge them to also think about the reaction that they're going to get from their constituents when they go home and spend the month of August in town hall meetings and traveling across their districts. I do think that there are going to be some rather pointed questions uh, that, uh, that Americans have about what Congress is doing to strengthen, to support the private sector as we, as we uh, recover, as we continue to strengthen our economy and we continue to recover. And 
uh, hopefully they'll put some things on their to-do list that will uh, strengthen their answer to that question. So, Nancy? Um, on Mr. Romney's trip, is there anything that he spoke about this weekend, whether it's regarding moving the uh, U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem or on sanctions on Syria, beyond Iran that you think interferes with U.S. foreign policy? Well, I, I uh, there is nothing that jumps out at me that um, that would in any way limit the president's ability to fulfill his responsibilities as the commander in chief, as the president of the United States, and as the leader of the free world. Uh, and those are priorities and responsibilities that the president takes very seriously. Those are priorities and responsibilities that the president believes should be above the partisan fray. Um, and despite the questions that I'm getting today, I'm doing my best to live up to that standard. But when you say that people are scratching their heads about his comments, you mean because his comments were confusing or out of line? Well, I think it's the way, in the way in which Jim posed his question. He asked what the uh, intention or meaning of Governor Romney, Governor Romney's comments were. Um, and so I would leave it to Governor Romney to, to explain them to the extent that there's some measure of confusion that led to Jim's question. Josh, on the uh, Commander in Chief question, uh, Senator McCain is on a tour right now about defense uh, sequestration cuts, uh, and he has been prodding the President saying he should show more leadership as Commander in Chief to, to come together on a deal here. And a Democrat as well, Dick Durbin, said that on CNN yesterday that President should, he, he said, with the President's leadership, there could be a bipartisan deal here to prevent these massive defense cuts. Where are we on that? Is the President making calls? Is he working to, to get a bipartisan deal? Uh, I don't have any specific calls to read out to you at this point. What I can tell you is that um, the President remains concerned about the impact that the sequester could have. Um, but it's important for everybody to remember how we got to this point, which is that the sequester was put in place, it was voted into law by Republicans and Democrats to force Congress to take action on a plan that would have a meaningful impact on our long-term deficit. In response to that, to those extended negotiations that led up to the sequester, the President put forward his own plan. Uh, he announced it in a Rose Garden ceremony. He posted on the White House website. I believe it's still there. Uh, a balanced approach to reducing our deficit by $4 trillion over 10 years. This is, a, this is an approach that includes significant cuts to government programs that in a different fiscal environment the President might otherwise support, uh, but it also includes uh, so asking uh, important reforms in Medicare and Medicaid that over the long term will make those programs stronger. Uh, but it also includes uh, those that asking those who make over $250,000 a year to pay their fair share, to pay a little bit more, so that we can take a balanced approach, that we can share the burden when it comes to dealing with our long-term deficit challenges. The reason that that's important is because we're not going to be able to cut our way out of this problem. Uh, and I think that's what most Americans understand. You, we, we're not, we can't gut our investments in education. We can't gut our investments in infrastructure. We can't gut our investments in research and development uh, and in clean energy um, to solve our deficit challenges. What we need to do is we need to grow our economy. And so those, those kinds of investments are important as we, uh, as we ensure that we have a 21st century uh, uh, modern infrastructure that can support our economy. So over the long term, what we're looking to do is to take a balanced approach to reduce our deficit, ask those at the top of the income scale to pay their fair share, uh, and make the kinds of investments that are going to strengthen our economy, not just in the short term, but also over the long term. Um, former President Bill Clinton, we hear, is going to have a big role at the convention. Uh, can you walk us through why the President chose him? They have not always been on the same page. Um, they've been on the same page on a lot of other things. Um, but also, there's some question as to whether this is going to overshadow Vice President Biden's role. Well, a, a couple of things about that. The first is, um, the first is the President himself, President Obama, has spoken uh, many times publicly about his, about his respect for President Clinton and President Clinton's ability to, um, to uh, and it, well, I should say it this way. President Obama has spoken frequently publicly uh, about President Clinton's success in dealing with some of the economic challenges that this country faced when President Clinton was here in the White House. Uh, and President Clinton's record speaks for itself. Uh, it certainly means that, that President Clinton is a very effective communicator. Uh, in terms of talking about the challenges that we face and in talking about the kind of vision that he and President Obama share in addressing and confronting these challenges. 
But could that not highlight the difficulties this president has had meeting those same economic challenges? Uh, I don't think so, because I think what ultimately you're going to find is President Clinton is going to reinforce the message that President Obama himself will be laying out uh, a day or two later, which is his belief that if we're going to strengthen our economy over the long term, we need to do it by strengthening the middle class, by investing in the middle class and growing our economy from the middle out. This is stands in stark contrast to the approach that's advocated by Governor Romney and congressional Republicans who believe that we should just shower the, the wealthy with tax cuts, that if we invest in those at the top of the income scale, that all the benefits will trickle down on everybody else and we'll all benefit. Um, we've tried that approach and it didn't work. Uh, President Clinton's approach, a balanced approach that asks those at the top of the income scale to pay their fair share, uh, while also dealing with our deficit, while also making important investments in infrastructure and education and research and development, that that's the way that we're going to grow our economy. That's those kinds of investments that ultimately benefit the middle class are what's going to lead to the strongest economic recovery for this nation. Uh, and I think the opportunity that President Clinton will have to deliver that message uh, in the convention is, isn't just in, in appropriate, it's something that will be very beneficial to the President. Last thing on a different topic to Bin Laden, Ray. there's a book out by an author, Richard Manitur, who in context seems like a critic of the President and is claiming that he has information that the Bin Laden raid was called off a few times, in part because Valerie Jarrett suggested to the President that he called it off. Does the White House have any reactions whether this is factually correct or? Uh, it is an utter fabrication. Um, it seems pretty clear that uh, Mr. Minotaur doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, Ms. Jarrett, uh, like many, like the vast majority of the President's senior staff, uh, was not read in on the uh, on the uh, the operation on the mission uh, against Osama bin Laden, uh, so I wouldn't put any stock into that vignette or into the book itself. Kristen, yeah, thanks. Uh, going back to Senator Durbin's comments, he said this weekend specifically, "We believe there is a responsible, reasonable way to move forward, and we're going to try to put something on the table uh, to be considered." He almost struck a cautiously optimistic tone there. Uh, what is the president's level of optimism? Here? they can actually get something done. Well, this is something that ultimately Congress is going to have to move on. Uh, the President has been uh, very candid about his views on this. You've all heard him talk about this quite extensively uh, on the road. Uh, you've heard him talk about it even from this podium. You've read the plan that the President has put out, the detailed plan that is on the White House website uh, that the President laid out 11 months, almost 11 months ago now. Um, so the President's views are, um, are, are quite well known. Uh, and it really is just a responsibility of Democrats and Republicans in Congress to come together to, uh, to resolve this challenge. The President believes that they should take, they should take a balanced approach to dealing with, this, with it. Uh, and that is going to require Republicans to do something that they haven't demonstrated willingness to do thus far, which is to stop fighting tooth and nail to protect the tax benefits of millionaires and billionaires. That can't be the top priority. What needs to be the top priority is dealing with our deficit. What needs to be our top priority is investing in the kinds of, of, of policies that are going to create a strong middle class and that are going to lay the groundwork to ensure that our economy can recover over the long term. Those should be the priorities. Uh, and you know, thus far, Republicans have made protecting the tax benefits of millionaires and billionaires a top priority. That's what stood in the way. As soon as they uh, drop that priority, or at least deprioritize it, um, then I think we're going to be able to make some ground. And the reason that's important is because is this: is that neither Demo although both Republicans and Democrats voted for the sequester in an effort to force some action on deficit reduction, neither Democrats nor Republicans support that policy. So it's in the interest of both parties to come together and, and try to resolve this. Does the president have any? sense of confidence that, that they will be able to come to a resolution on this, given that they failed so many times in the past? Well, given the stakes, the President is certainly hopeful uh, that Republicans will uh, adopt an approach that is supported by the vast majority of Americans, according to some polls, is even supported by a majority of Republicans, which is that we should adopt a balanced approach. We should ask those at the top of the income scale, those making more than $250,000 a year uh, and higher, to pay a little bit more to do their fair share, that coupled with uh, tough decisions about uh, cuts in government spending, uh, coupled with uh, reforms to the Medicare program, uh, and, and other things that are part of this balanced approach, uh, will lead us to a solution that ultimately is in the best interests of the American people and the American economy. I also want to get your reaction to uh, the reports today about the Inspector General uh, who finalized, who just 
discovered that the U.S. initiative to spend hundreds of millions of dollars on construction projects in Afghanistan, which is part of the effort to combat the Taliban, won't actually be finished um, and yield results until the majority of U.S. troops have been withdrawn. Does the administration have a reaction? Uh, I've seen the, re the reports of this, uh, of, of the study, uh, but I don't have an actual reaction to, to give to you at this point. If you want to check back a little bit later, we'll see what we can do for you on that. Okay. I'm going to try and move it around just a little bit. Um, Ari? Thanks. Uh, today, apparently, the committee charged with drafting the Democratic Party platform for the convention unanimously approved, uh, including support for same-sex marriage. And I wonder if you have any reaction to that. Uh, I haven't seen those reports. Uh, you know, the, the President's position on this view have been um, well chronicled, shall we say. Uh, but in terms of a specific reaction to the platform, I'd refer you to my colleagues at the DNC. So, Roger. Uh, some of the congressional Democrats uh, are highlighting differences with the president when they're on the campaign trail. Uh, others are skipping the convention. We've read about that. Uh, others won't even say whether they favor the president for the second term. Um, how do you guys respond to that? Well, I, um, you know, this is something that happens, I think, every four years on both sides, frankly. And I know that um, what the president's focused on right now is uh, certainly his his day job here as the, as the commander in chief. But when it comes to his reelection, what the president is interested in doing is making uh, the case to the American people, to all Americans, Democrats, Republicans, and independents, uh, about what his vision is for the future of this country, about his view that it's so important to invest in a strong middle class, the key to our economic recovery is investing in the middle class so we can grow our economy from the middle out, and how that stands in pretty stark contrast to the policies that are being advocated by the other side. And the president himself has has been pretty candid about his view that whomever is listening to him, that if they agree with what uh, Governor Romney and congressional Republicans are saying about the benefits of offering tax cuts to the wealthy and how that prospect uh, could lead to economic strength, the President has said that if you agree with that approach, an approach that we've tried and has not worked, but if you agree with that approach, whether you're a Democrat or Republican or an independent, that you should support the other guy. Uh, but the President has also said if you agree with him that invorce, investing in the middle class is what is the, is the best way to grow our economy, that that's the tried and true method of a strong American economy, that Democrats, Republicans, and independents who feel that way should support the President. That's the case that he'll be making, uh, and that's a case that, that, that frankly transcends partisan lines. Is there any concern that it's a, a sign of diminished support among Democrats, especially in sort of Republican-leaning districts? No, it's not. Here. Josh, you mentioned uh, in response to some earlier questions of the economic issues in the Middle East, uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, specifically, and uh, the status of Jerusalem should be settled as part of the peace process. Realistically, what are the prospects for any progress anytime soon <coughs> on that? And, and what, if anything, is the President doing to promote it? Well, I don't want to be in a position of, of trying to handicap the outcome uh, of those kinds of conversations. This is something that uh, many American Presidents have have worked on. Uh, there is no doubt about the interest that the United States of America has in the resolution of some of those issues. Uh, that, that turmoil in that region uh, is not in the best interest of the United States of America. Uh, we've seen the President's strong support for the nation of Israel uh, in a wide range of formats. Uh, you know, the President signed a piece of legislation in the Oval Office on Friday. Uh, further deepening the security cooperation between the United States and Israel. You've seen the President stand on the floor of the United Nations uh, against efforts to delegitimize Israel or to minimize their security concerns. Uh, you've seen the President stand uh, to block efforts at the UN to go around those, uh, those negotiations between the parties in terms of, uh, of the Palestinians' efforts to get statehood, be recognized for statehood at, at the United Nations. Uh, you know, you've seen the President, uh, when he traveled to, uh, to Israel as a candidate, uh, affirm his solidarity with the, with the Israeli people, uh, that he, where he talked about the Iron Dome program that commenced under his, his watch uh, and has been, uh, you know, we, where we've invested nearly $300 million in that program that to this day, right now as we're talking, uh, is providing a blanket of protection for the Israeli people who had previously been in danger of being, uh, of being showered with, uh, with rockets fired from Gaza. So, uh, you know, the, the, president's, the president has a long record on these issues, both in terms of his, uh, you know, of his strong support uh, with Israel, uh, but also in articulating his interest uh, about why it's important to the United States.
for some of these issues to be confronted, to be negotiated between the parties, and ultimately resolved. Can you point to any progress in the peace process since he took office? In the well, peace process? Sure. Well, you know, there have been a number of, of, uh, of dialogue sessions that the President's participated in, both unilaterally but also trilaterally. Uh, there were some of those meetings at the White House. Uh, in the past, and that was uh, those were conversations that the president played an influential role in. Um, and you know what the what ultimately the way this is going to be resolved is dialogue through those parties. And the president is interested in doing what he can to play a leadership role in facilitating some of that dialogue uh, and reaching this, uh, reaching a a conclusion that is of course in the best interests of the two parties who are part of that dialogue. Uh, but that but that but that enduring resolution is something that is in the. Uh, solid interest of the United States of America. One quick question on a yes. totally different subject, okay. domestically. Uh, is the President aware of this report that's out there today about this family tree? Mm -hmm. I have seen, I've seen some of those reports. I have not talked to the President about it, about it today, though. Okay. Laura? In the past, White House officials have said that Mitt Romney's position on Iran showed no discernible difference with the President's position, and that if he wanted to articulate a difference, he should. Do, in the wake of his speech in Israel about Iran, do you still feel the same way that he has essentially not carved out any difference with administration policy, or do you see something different? Well, I, I think in terms of the specific positions that Mitt Romney is, has advocated on his trip, I would I would refer you to my uh, colleagues at the campaign. But this isn't really a, uh, this is exactly a campaign question. I'm asking well, based you're, on you're sort of asking me to assess whether or not he agrees or disagrees with the president of the United States. So, uh, you know. If, I, I guess if you're a little confused about what position Mitt Romney is taking, then I guess I su suggest that you, you reach out to his campaign. Um, but I, I don't know that I, I'm in a position to assess you know, how strongly or weakly he agreed with the president. So, go ahead. How serious do you think that Iran's presence in the Gulf is as far as the world oil supply is concerned? Well, I, uh, we certainly are concerned about instability in the region. It's one of the reasons that we uh, have worked, as I mentioned earlier, in, in collaboration with our partners around the globe and even partners there uh, in the region to uh, try to bring some greater stability to, uh, to that region that it, is, that it has in the past had, had some impact on, on, uh, on oil prices, and it's why we're eager for the Iranian regime to live up to their international obligations. And um, that's, that's where we are. As far as the U.S.-India economic and uh, trade relations are concerned, recently uh, hundreds of Indian companies have been investing in India billions of dollars and creating thousands of jobs. Is there some kind of special agreement between the two countries now? Now, since the form, uh, finance minister of India is now the president of India. Mm -hmm. I, uh, in terms of the details of our trade relationship with India, I'd refer you to the, to the USTR. I don't have any details on, on the... On, this, on the relationship that you're citing there. So, Jen? Thanks, Josh. Uh, Senator Lautenberg and Congresswoman McCarthy just introduced a new bill that would ban online ammunition sales. Their bill would also require reporting to law enforcement of bulk ammunition sales. I'm wondering if the President would support a bill like this. Uh, I don't know that he's seen that specific piece of legislation uh, that's been offered. Uh, you know, the President's views that have been relayed quite frequently over the last few days, uh, you know, is that he believes in, in, uh, in, in the Second Amendment of the Constitution, in the right to bear arms. Uh, but he also believes uh, that we should take uh, robust steps uh, within existing law to ensure that guns don't fall in the hands of criminals or others who shouldn't have them. Does that um, include ban a ban on online sales of ammunition? Well, like I said, I haven't seen the specific piece of legislation that, that has been offered up today. Uh, but as those, as that, and other pieces of legislation make their way through the legislative process, uh, you know, we'll consider, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll evaluate them uh, as they make their way through the process. And he will evaluate a bill like this. I'm sorry. He, the president would evaluate a bill like this. That uh, you know, the, our administration will be taking a look at at the at at, uh, at this legislation and others uh, as they make their way uh, as they make their way through Congress. Can you check so. on that particular thing whether he supports it or not? Yes. Uh, I, I, I can take a look. Amy. Can you tell us why the White House decided to weigh in on this whole Winston Churchill bust um, scandal and whether you guys are going to clarify what bust is where? And <laughs> <laughs> it is almost like a bad Sherlock Holmes script, right? <laughs> the, the case of the missing Winston Churchill bust. 
Uh, the reason that uh, we weighed in on Friday is because there is uh, a myth floating in some of the darker corners of the internet <laughs> that suggests that upon taking office, the president went out of his way to snub the British people by prematurely returning the bust of Winston Churchill that had occupied uh, a prominent place in the Oval Office under the previous president. That's not true. Uh, as the, the White House curator has previously explained, and I believe as we explained at the end of the day on Friday, uh, the bust was loaned to President Bush by the British government. Uh, as is customary at the conclusion of President Bush's term, uh, and before President Obama entered the Oval Office, uh, the bust was returned to the British Embassy. What hasn't changed are two things. One, the President's, uh, the priority and value that the President places on our special relationship with the United Kingdom. And two, the location of the prominently placed Winston Churchill bust in the White House residence. Uh, and I think you may have seen the picture that we put on the White House website on Friday of of President Obama showing off the Churchill bust in the White House residence to Prime Minister Cameron when he visited the U.S. back in March. <laughs> Have we settled the case of the missing Winston Churchill bust? I hope so. Brianna? Um, Senator McCain said that the ruling fiscal cliff situation requires President Obama to leadership, and he's accused the President of being MIA on it. What's your reaction to that? Well, my reaction is that uh, the President has uh, expressed his concerns quite vividly uh, about the impact that the sequester would have, both on our national security but also on some programs that are pretty important to a strong middle class. Uh, the President has also noted frequently that the sequester is something that was voted into law by Republicans and Democrats, and it was voted into law as an action-forcing mechanism to convince Congress to finally take important steps to reduce our deficit over the long term. Uh, and the President is hopeful that Congress will follow through on those important steps and prevent the sequester from taking effect. Uh, that there are a whole range of reasons why that's true. Uh, this is something on which there is bipartisan agreement. As you point out, Senator McCain is expressing concerns about the impact that the sequester would have. The President himself has expressed similar concerns. The Defense Secretary has expressed similar concerns. So what we need right now is we need for Congress to take some action. And what seems to me and other members of the administration to be the principal stumbling block is the commitment, the diehard commitment on behalf of congressional Republicans to even consider asking millionaires and billionaires to pay a little bit more to deal with our deficit challenges. This seems like it should be a common sense policy proposal that we could get done. There is, uh, broadly speaking, um, support from the American people for a balanced approach, similar to the one that the President's advocated. You've seen bipartisan commissions, uh, including the Simpson-Bowles Commission, including the Dem Domenici Rivlin Commission, including the Gang of Six, uh, all of which are bipartisan bodies who spent a lot of time taking a look at this challenge and have advocated a balanced approach similar to the one that the President has put forward. What about what I mean, he could do. You're saying that he's I mean, is expressing concerns and noting things frequently and being hopeful that a Congress that doesn't normally act will act? Is that and, a strong presidential leadership? You know that one key thing, which is laying out a very specific plan for how we can resolve this challenge. But why not get more involved than just putting a plan just talk about it and offer a specific solution that's broadly supported by the American people about how to resolve it? That's what the president has done. Why not do something so the, more than that? The, well, is that strong presidential leadership? I think that it is strong presidential leadership. Advocating a, a, an approach that is balanced, that, uh, that mirrors the, the approach that bipartisan commissions have taken, that we, everybody acknowledges would do something serious about our deficit challenges, reducing uh, our deficit by $4 trillion over the course of 10 years, including some very difficult cuts in government programs that in a different fiscal environment the president might otherwise support. Um, you know, we've cut government spending down to the lowest level uh, as, uh, as it was during the Eisenhower administration when you consider it as a, as a percentage of GDP. So the President has made important sacrifices, the President has laid out a specific plan, and the President has made his case to the public about why this is the right approach. When it comes to the point of going over the fiscal cliff, and obviously that would hurt the middle class that the President says he's the champion of, um, 
will he feel comfortable pointing to what he's done and saying, well, hey, I did that, and that was that was enough? That was strong that, leadership. The things that you just talked about. Is uh, that enough in the end? I, I think the president and the American people acknowledge that he's played an important leadership role in trying to advance this debate. And I think most people recognize, uh, and I think most people who take a look at this situation without a, a partisan point of view, and it doesn't seem like there are uh, many people in Washington, D.C. who are able to do that, but people who take a look at this from a, a neutral perspective uh, acknowledge that re congressional Republicans who have dug in their heels to protect the tax benefits of millionaires and billionaires are, are the chief obstacle to a solution. Uh, I'm not trying to make the case to you that these kinds of decisions uh, are easy, but I do think that it's pretty easy to figure out right now what the chief stumbling block is. And as soon as Republicans are willing to drop that opposition and acknowledge that a balanced approach is the one that's been historically supported by bipartisan commissions that have spent a lot of time studying this, uh, it's an approach that's supported by a majority of the American public and, and even a majority of some Republicans, according to, to at least a couple of polls, that that's how we're going to eventually reach a solution. And the goal of the sequester is to raise the stakes. Uh, and this is, a, this is a goal that was shared by Republicans and Democrats. Uh, so there's no doubt that congressional failure to take action on this will have very, very serious consequences. Uh, and recognition of those consequences is hopefully the first step to reevaluating priorities uh, and finding the kind of balanced approach uh, that should be bipartisan in nature, that has been bipartisan in the past, uh, and that will ultimately deal with our deficit challenges, which is something that both Republicans and Democrats agree we need to do. Uh, and then just a quick follow on uh, President Clinton's role in the convention. The, President Obama is not concerned at all that having him in that role will highlight their respective economic policies or outcomes and that that may not serve President Obama well in the convention. Um, well, I mean, for detailed questions about the convention, I would encourage you to check with the campaign. But what I can tell you is that... Yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, and I think, as I mentioned earlier, a couple of things. President Clinton has appeared publicly with President Obama in a couple of different settings. Uh, I think most recently in New York a couple of months ago. Um, and as I mentioned, I think President Clinton, because of his record on these issues, because he shares President Obama's view that the best policies to put in place are the kinds of economic policies that invest in the middle class, that will grow our economy from the middle out, are the, are the right approach. Um, that President Clinton's participation at the convention will be a very important way to reinforce President Obama's views. Uh, and that, that uh, multiplier effect, if you will, um, will make it clear the choice that, uh, that voters have in this election. George. Uh, thank you. Uh, two questions. Do you think it's appropriate for a candidate to have uh, fundraisers on foreign soil? And secondly, is the president watching the Olympics? <laughs> uh, for your question about the propriety of fundraising locations, I'd refer you to my colleagues at the campaign who organize fundraising events. Uh, they can talk to you about uh, their views on that. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the president's Olympic viewership, uh, I haven't spoken to him since the uh, events uh, uh, began their round-the-clock broadcasting on uh, uh, a range of NBC outlets. Um, but I can tell you that going into the Olympics, the president was very interested. So now that we're 72 hours into it, I'd be surprised if the president hadn't spent some time uh, watching our uh, Olympians compete on the international stage. So, Alexis. Josh, um, let me follow up on something you came. My understanding is he's been trying to float alternatives that might attract Republican support. Does the president believe that Senator McCain has been showing leadership in his party up to this point, trying to work on the sequestration problems? And secondly, isn't this level of anxiety that's building exactly what the president had hoped might? Isn't that what he expected to have happen by now? Isn't that a good sign, in other words, that there's a lot of interest percolating on this issue now? Well, as I mentioned, the reason that both Republicans and Democrats voted for this last summer was because it would raise the stakes and it would be an action-forcing mechanism to convince Congress to take the steps that they need. Uh, these steps aren't easy, and so raising the stakes uh, has been has been important and was an important part of the plan for eventually reaching uh, some sort of bipartisan agreement to make these kinds of steps, to take these kinds of steps. So, uh, so generally speaking, I do think that this is what 
uh, Democrats and Republicans had in mind when they voted for the sequester. In terms of Senator McCain's role in all of this, uh, I'm not aware, frankly, of all of the things that uh, all of the conversations that Senator McCain has had or the proposals that he may, may or may not be floating. Um, but I can tell you that the President has said many times uh, that he's willing to work with uh, anybody in Congress, Democrat or Republican, who is willing to pursue a constructive, balanced approach to dealing with our deficit challenges. And if Senator McCain is in that, in that category, then I'm confident that members of this administration will be working with him uh, to reach a solution. So, Thanks. yes, Victoria. On the cybersecurity bill coming up this week, uh, th which Senator McCain and some other senators watered down to some extent last week, or quite a lot last week, there's been some criticism in the Senate that the president hasn't been involved enough in getting that bill moving <laughs> forward. Do you accept that criticism? Uh, I don't. I can tell you that the um, I, I, well, I'm not able to speak on the specifics of the, le the piece of legislation that you're talking about. Um, you know, reaching a coherent uh, cybersecurity policy is something that the President believes is very important, both to our economic security but also our national security. Um, but in terms of the details of the legislation that's moving through Congress, um, I'm going to have to get some more information from our, my colleagues at the National Security Council. Um, I actually would just suggest that you reach out to them directly and they can fill you in on this. Uh, an Olympic-related question. Sure. Um, did the president watch the opening ceremonies? Uh, I, to be honest with you, I don't know whether or not he, he caught any of the, Olympic cer the opening ceremonies. What is your view of the decision by NBC to cut the <laughs> tribute to the dead and to air an interview by Ryan Seacrest instead? <laughs> well, I watched, the, I watched the Olympic ceremonies. I'm not sure that I was aware that that happened. Um, but maybe that's because I wasn't paying close enough attention. Um, so I, I don't have any specific specific reaction to that, and um, I'm not sure that I would. I'm prepared to stand up here and play media critic in chief anyway. So, uh, sure, sure, I'll give you the last one. Okay, thanks. Um, Democratic leaders on the Hill are already working on a uh, package for, with a continuing resolution to uh, get the spending bills out of the political season. Does the White House support a three month or a six month extension? Uh, I've seen those reports, Cheryl. I'll have to get back to you in terms of whether or not we're weighing in on any of the proposals. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, the, the President uh, certainly believes that we shouldn't be uh, in a position where we're playing chicken in terms of shutting down the, the government, uh, either in the election season or outside of the election season. That there should be a more uh, strategic approach that we can take to, to resolving some of those challenges. Uh, but in terms of the proposals that have been floated on Capitol Hill, I'm going to have to get back to you uh, in terms of whether or not there's one that we've weighed in uh, in support of. Okay? All right. Th thanks, everybody.